Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Intuitive Answer to Riddle and Simulation. Please note that this presentation assumes a basic knowledge in magnetic circuit. A forthcoming video will include an explanation of magnetic circuit theory and application. So here is the riddle that I've posted earlier. We have here a core, three legs, the ferrite core, no gap, there are three windings on each one of the legs. The middle one, there is an excitation of 10 volt AC. And then on the side legs, we have four ohms, one ohm. The ratio is one, one to one. That is the same number of uh, turns on each leg. The question was, what are V1 and V2 voltages as it is? That is with one ohm, four ohm, and 10 volt excitation. Second question was, what will be I1 if R1 is shorted? That is what will be this current if we short here this one ohm. And the third one was, what will be V2, that is this voltage here, if R1 is shorted, that is this one is shorted, this of course is, remains to be four ohm. And the question is, what is the voltage here? And uh, there is an assumption that there is a constant cross-section. Of course, the ferrite has a high permeability and there is uh, no saturation, things like that. So it's a normal operating point. To explain the answer, we need to consider the magnetic circuit. One way to do that is to build a reluctance model, which I'm going to go over very quickly here. And as I've pointed out, there'll be a video with the full explanation. So here is some basic concept of reluctance and magnetic models. If we have a piece of ferrite, let's say one of the legs, and we have turns on it, and I'm assuming the length of this piece is like LE five centimeters, the cross section is 10 to the minus four, then we can define the reluctance of this circuit as one over mu zero, mu r, ae, that is the cross section, and le, this is the magnetic length that we are considering here, where mu sub zero is the air or vacuum permeability, and then mu r is the relative permeability, and of course it depends on the material. Now ferrite could be between say 1,000 to 5,000 or even more. An amorphous material could be even 100,000 relative permeability. So this is the very basic concept of reluctance. And once we have it, we have to couple it to the electrical part. So the reluctance part is shown here. I have here the reluctance as defined earlier. And then I have the MMF, N times R, I is the current here, N is the number of turns. So this will be the magnetic branch here. And I'm going to couple it to the terminals here, which are electrical terminals. And this will be done by considering the fact that if you have a flux here, then the voltage across these terminals is the derivative N d phi dt. This is the voltage across these terminals. And of course, then you can either have an excitation or you can have a load. So there is an interaction between this EMF and the voltage or the load, which will of course develop a current. So this is the very, very basic of magnetic circuit. So here is a simple model of the structure that we have been considering, the ferrite with the three legs. Here are the three legs. These are the reluctances. This is for this particular piece of uh, ferrite that I've shown earlier. I'm assuming that I'm exciting it by a 10 volt, 100 kilohertz. This is the excitation. And that is the back EMF coming from the mid leg. This voltage source as well as uh, these ones and these one are just used for measurement. The basic method of SPICE or any SPICE-based simulator like LT SPICE, which I'm using here, is to refer to a current as the current through a voltage. So I, we are putting here a voltage source of zero voltage. It does not interact with the operation of the circuit, but it allows to 
have a reference to it. So what I have here is just a translation of what I've said earlier. We have the excitation, we have the back EMF, and then we have the NI here, the MMF resulting from the currents of each of the windings. Here we have a load which is 4 ohm, here we have 1 ohm, this is for this particular example, the first question, and then I have here again the uh, voltage sources for measurement, and these are the reluctances according to this slab here. Now the derivative is uh, implemented here by the uh, DDT operator of uh, LT Spice, which is really very handy. And the MMF is translated from the current on each of the branches through a behavioral voltage source. Now in order to solve the riddle that I've posed, we need some assumptions to make. We have here the MMF and then we have a reluctance. There is a voltage drop across the reluctance. And as I'll show, as it turns out, the voltage drop in practical circuit is very small. Now, this ATK is reluctance. Now, the dimension of the reluctance is 1 over Henry. And as you notice, if I add here n square, this is the equation of the inductance with an n square. Well, n has no dimension, so this is why it's still 1 over Henry. So, in fact, this term is like a n, that is the inductance per one term. I can assume that the voltage drop across it is very small, so it means that we have a current here, the same current here, and basically the same current here. Now the input power is the current times 10 volt, and the output will be the current times V1 plus the current times V2, which means that V1 plus V2 must be equal to 10, and therefore the current is 10 over R1 plus R2, which means that it is 2 amp, and therefore V1 is 2 volt and V2 is 8 volt. 2 amps times 1 is 2 volt, 2 amps times 4 is 8 volt. And then for the question of what will happen if this one is shorted, the current now will be 2.5 amp, using the same logic here, and then the voltage here will be this, this 2.5 amp times 4, which is 10 volt. So this is the answer to the riddle based on this reluctance model with the assumption that I've made. So let's run now this simulation. Again, I'm assuming that the reluctance is 80K, 1 over Henry, and then the excitation 10 volt loaded by 1 ohm and 4 ohm on the two sides. And here it is. So what we see here is, first of all, that all the currents are exactly the same. This is the current through the three windings. We see here now the voltages on the two side legs, and I multiplied one of them by four just to show that they are exactly the same. That is, the ratio is one to four, and you can see that they are the same, one on top of the other. And then I'm looking here at the flux. Well, there is a problem here because this model has a problem to handle the DC component because the DC component does not pass through this derivative. So there is some offset here and this is one of the shortcomings of this model. But in general what we see here is that for the AC component we see the flux generated by the source and then we see the two fluxes of the two sides. Notice that the fluxes are not the same. And the reason is that if you have different voltages, the flux is related to the voltage. And if the voltages of the two sides are not the same, then the flux will not be the same. So an assumption that the flux of the mid leg is sort of divided equally on each side is just incorrect. So knowing the magnitude of the flux, or the order of magnitude, I should say, we can have a notion of what would be the flux density in this particular case and so this, the flux density is the flux over the cross-section area and in this particular case it's only one millitesla so this is really a core that 
can sustain a much higher power. This is just an example, of course. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. Now, just a reminder, watch for the forthcoming video for full explanation of magnetic circuits and equivalent electrical models of complex magnetic structures.